I know we're all super caffeinated, ready to go. If we could all take our seats, please, for the next session. Now that we have all the coffee and all the pastries, we're all raring to go for our next session, I'm sure. Okay, just as you get settled, one small housekeeping announcement. So today is the deadline for the craftivism submissions, the ones that you've been all been very well working away on in G006 or here in the auditorium. The deadline, we've extended it ever so slightly until after the final moot court preparatory session finishes this evening until 5.30. So you can be thinking of arguments in moot and crafting away at the same time, busily crafting away. Then you submit your pieces to Emma using the directions in the program booklet. And if it so happens that you miss that deadline, don't panic. What we will do then is include your piece in the online collage. We'll take a photograph of it and include it in the online collage. But if you really, really want it included in the actual physical piece, 5.30 today, that's it. Doors will close. Lots of work will happen to try and put it together, but that is our final deadline. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over it to Niall Muldoon and uh, the next session. Thank you very much, Kleena. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going to skip straight in to uh, introduce our, our first speaker in this session, Rosemary K.S., who's a human rights lawyer working in the area of disability and reform. She's advised on issues such as housing, education, guardianship, and employment, and is currently the vice chair of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Persons with Disability. Rosemary, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, what I want to actually start with is an excerpt from a book chapter that I wrote um, several years ago. So please forgive me if uh, you've had to read it before, and um, I'm saying stuff you've already heard from me. But for those of you who haven't, um, what I'd like to do is first just scope out what, what is the vision of inclusive education. We're different, we're the same, and we're all wonderful. Now that, that quote comes from Big Bird, the famous Sesame Street character. And underlying Big Bird's pithy sentiments are the assumptions that Human diversity is broad in nature, and we are all members of the human family with inherent dignity and worth. What is more, we all have something to contribute, and we belong together. So in terms of education, that is critical to understand. What we experience and what the ideal is, is very different. So, can you go up a little bit further for me, please? And a bit more, a bit further. So what is the ideal? So what does an inclusive education experience look like? It is different from different perspectives and can be illustrated by the experience of the non-disabled student, the teacher, and the student with a disability. From the perspective of a non-disabled student, there is no question about where their sibling, friend and neighbour will go to school. They will all go to school together. They are all part of the same community and the same world. All students will observe and participate in the learning of one another. Non-disabled students will see adaptions that enable all students' participation and performance. They will watch teachers move seamlessly between the needs of students, aware of the value of, the, of including everyone in the classroom. The non-disabled student won't remember when or how they learnt sign language. It was just what just part of the immersion program. 
but signing behind the teacher's back and across noisy rooms is often one of their greatest pleasures. As is singing in the deaf and hearing choir, the non-disabled student is keen to learn Braille because of the enormous benefits of being able to continue to read after lights out. The typical non-disabled student will detect perceived weaknesses in their peers and identify injustices largely to themselves, asking questions such as, why does she get extra time? Or a reader or a computer in exams. At best, they will witness bullying, and at worst, they may participate in it. The consequence of which will be a strong response from the school that reinforces its general safe school policies and the importance and value of diversity and respect. By the time the non-disabled student finish their education and commence their working life, some of their friends and peers will be people with a diverse range of abilities. Consequently, their assumptions of life will be of mixing with people with a diverse range of abilities. They will imagine and expect to work in places that are gender, age, culture, race, religion, and ability diverse, as their school was. Moreover, as a result of their educational experience, they will know how this is meant to look and what is required to realise it. It will leave them with an incomprehensible view of today's unemployment statistics for persons with disabilities. And finally, the fear of disability is diminished by the knowledge and experience of a life that includes the spectrum of human diversity. The teacher in an inclusive school will have studied the philosophy, legality and practices of inclusion in the teacher education. They will have an understanding of the range of diverse educational needs that may present in their classroom and the school. Their classroom layout will be interactive and interesting with self-access centres for activities such as problem solving, reading, computer work and quiet corners that allow students time out and independent learning opportunities while still being together. The teacher will have the skills and knowledge to differentiate the curriculum content and materials so that they can be adapted to different students' needs and learning styles. Interest groups and flexible groupings will be used in cooperative learning projects that enable all group members to individually contribute to the collective whole. Reciprocal peer teaching will be commonplace between all students and teachers' aides will seamlessly work in the classroom, connecting with all students whilst providing specific support to some. Underscoring all this will be the leadership of the school's senior staff who will have obtained their positions in part on the basis of their skills and leadership in inclusion. They will oversee a whole school program that teaches human rights, the breadth and depth of human diversity, respect for and valuing difference and the universality of human dignity all of which will be reflected in the makeup of the school staff. This program will be partnered with strong safe school and anti-bullying po policies and practices. Finally, the teacher will be confident and comfortable in working with all parents to achieve the optimum outcomes 
for their sons and daughters. For the student with disabilities, inclusion in school may be the first time they see that disability is just one of the characteristics in the spectrum of human diversity. Teachers with disabilities in the school will serve as role models, encouraging ambition. The school, classroom and learning adaptations will be the beginning of a life of solutions. The value and significance of opportunities to contribute to a group in class, sport and extracurricular activities will reinforce that many make up the whole and each in their way is important. There will be no them, just us. Now that is the vision behind Article 24 in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. It is about building an inclusive education system that establishes a framework that enables all children to be taught together. But this still is an ambitious goal rather than a transformative right. We are still not in the point where states' parties have inclusive education systems. Can you swipe up and get a PowerPoint for me, please? Down the bottom. Turn. Go back to the down. And again. And again. Thank you. So the right to education for all is accepted. States parties have accepted inclusive education as they ratify the Convention on the Rights of, edu uh, the rights of Persons with Disabilities. But it is practised with writers that determine where and how the education is delivered. So terms like possible, practicable, and in the best interests of the child, and the least restrictive environment, which is the maximum extent appropriate, that children with disabilities are educated with children who are not disabled. So there is a continuous assumption that there will always be students with disability that cannot be accommodated in an inclusive local neighbourhood school. There is a continu continuation and growth of segregated special schools designed to meet the needs of students with types or categories of disability where the support needs are determined to be high and to be met, uh, too high to be met in the local school. So how do we break this nexus? How do we, how do we break down the ableism that's behind the process of special schooling? The value judgment the de devalue, sorry, the value judgments that create low expectations of students with disabilities. We continue to be blocked in breaking down not only those value judgments, but also the vested interests that are firmly established within special education systems. Until we can address those vested interests and that value system, we cannot break through to get inclusive education. It will require significant change from states parties. The committee sees segregated education of students with disabilities 
throughout the globe. And that extends from being segregated in specialist schools, completely separate, isolated within units within mainstream schooling, or segregated at home through not being enrolled in education at all. Education's long been recognised as a cornerstone right. One of those rights that have the ability to ensure that people can go on to exercise other core fundamental human rights. It sets people up for them to be able to participate within democratic society to engage in the economic life of the community, to be able to form lifelong trusted friendships and relationships. For kids with disability to be denied these opportunities is a process to just deny them human rights on a larger lifelong scale. Individual communications that come before the committee and states' reports continue to demonstrate very little in the way of movement towards establishing inclusive education. We find small pockets in some provincial areas, but no whole scale commitment and transformative steps being taken to create the mechanisms that are needed in teacher education and training, in architecture and the design of the school environment, in the leadership and promotion of teachers with inclusive education skills. All those steps and measures that need to be taken to ensure there can be what is required by Article 24, an inclusive education system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, again, hugely inspiring words and for me and busy taking notes there. I'm definitely going to be quoting you constantly now that I've got a proper definition of Article 24. You said, this will be the beginning of a life of solutions. There will be no more them, just us. That's my definition of Article 24 from now on. It's fantastic. And again, highlighting the concerns we have internationally, and I've seen it in Ireland, but also internationally in other countries where there's pockets of progress, but not wholesale change. And I think that's even those three areas that you finished on, uh, teacher training, the school architecture, environment and policy, we can start working on each piece, I think one step at a time, but what needs to be wholesale. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to our, our next speakers, plural. Uh, we're delighted to, to uh, welcome Reardon and Pippa Black. Reardon is 14 years of age, has been unschooled for all of their education. The last of the four the last of four neurodivergent children, all of their older siblings, are unschooling graduates. Raiden identifies as gender fluid and questioning. He, she, they. They're currently working towards growing a YouTube channel. And with the, when you've got the address here, I'm not gonna read it out, I'm becoming a games developer. Pippa, who's Raiden's mum, is an undiagnosed autistic herself. She left university in New Zealand with degrees in law and sociology and immediately started a family. I won't go into the rest of it. I'm sure they're going to have, engage in a conversation here today, which I hope will, will be enlightening for everybody and a, a different way of, of approaching. And, and I really thank the two of them for being here. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we're delighted to be here. I'm very honored to have been invited. And it's very illustrious company that we're amongst. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, Cleanus said, you know, a lot of people will be speaking from personal experiences and advised you to maybe refrain from intrusive questions. 
but I just wanted to make it clear from our perspective that um, you don't actually know what's an intrusive question for us and some things that you might want to hold back on, we'd be quite happy to answer. So in the Q&A, please feel free to ask your questions. And if we find them intrusive, don't be offended if we say, we'll, we'll leave that one. You may ask us any question, but we don't owe you an answer. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I just made a whole lot of notes then when Rosemary was sharing her vision um, because unschooling is a form of home education and, and that's what we've been doing. Um, and when Rosemary shared her vision, it reminded me that there is an opportunity cost with taking your children out. And I felt it very strongly when I lived in Wellington and I was told that there were 27 different cultures in our local primary school. And I was very aware that we would struggle to get our kids access to that kind of diversity. Um, and that is something in the home ed movement that we work quite hard to, to mix and to do social things and find each other. Um, but we have to be actively seeking out difference and diversity to enrich the experience that our, we can provide for our children. So that, that is an issue. But the big thing that we had in common was with this vision that you're setting up young people to fight for their democratic rights. And the way, I believe, the way we've done our version of home education, and there is no right way, this was our choice, it is based on uh, taking children seriously, which is a, a parenting movement that happened in the sort of 90s, and giving them a voice in how they're educated, how the families run, what are the family guidelines and rules. It's a, it's a participative, respectful system. And I'll tell you what, if you respect your kids from babyhood and give them a voice as much as they have the capacity, as soon as they have it, when they go out into the world and they face injustice, <laughs> you've made an activist. <laughs> um, and we see that a lot with um, Redden's, or well, my, my third offspring. Um, they're doing counselling in Limerick, and they're the one on the course pushing for inclusive sex ed in schools, do, doing um, workshops on talking to your kids about pornography use, which is another thing with home ed. You give your kids unfettered access to the wealth of educational resources on the internet, you need to be willing to have those conversations. Um, that's, that's the reality of, of life today. Um, right, so what I want to do here is give Ren a chance to talk. Um, I'll have, Ren might have to slap me or something. Um, and ask Ren some questions. We've had a very different experience with our elder three. I had three kids under four for three months, and I maybe was a bit deranged. <laughs> it's a totally different experience from Ren, and there's a nearly 10-year gap before Redden was born. And so Redden's been home educated nearly as an only child, but with this input from older siblings. Um, so that peer-to-peer -peer that Rosemary was talking about, we have that. Um, the other thing, one more thing before I start giving Redden a voice, sorry. Um, the president of, of the university, when he welcomed us, he said, universities aren't these institutions that send out knowledge, but they're places that learn. And that's what our home has been. Me and my husband have learned. Our kids teach us things every day. I don't know who benefits most out of this dynamic because we as parents have benefited hugely. So we'll start talking about what is unschooling. Redden, do you want to have a crack at what it is for you? <sighs> well... <sighs> Unschooling is sort of like letting the child sort of learn themselves. It's instead of having a structured education with his like lessons and such, instead I've just sort of like roamed the internet and just found information. Because, well, here's an idea that I've come up with of information osmosis. If you're around people who know things, you will start to know things as well. You will slowly just gain information by being around the people who have the information. That is one of like the core fundamentals of how I've learned what I've learned. That is just basically the core of how I was home educated. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair enough. Um, I think too, well, we've been a little bit of talk today about mental health, and one thing with our structure is, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
you know, having a secure environment, having good mental health, those have been our, our, the base of our pyramid, the most important things. The academics are less important than well-being and personal identity. And that is something that unschooling helps because actually it looks like living life. Yeah. Um, we've had to translate it for the authorities. See, I realise we're privileged. Here in Ireland, we don't just have a right to education, we have a right to home education. And I know there's going to be people here from nations where you simply don't. It's not going to be an option for you. And we have to take that into account and respect that that is your reality. But the kind of environment that we can build at home as unschoolers, you can build in your families outside of schooling. Because it is it's just living your life. Um, and learning from what comes up. One thing we do from the educator's perspective, because it's not laissez-faire, we do have oversight, we do have involvement. Um, and one of the techniques we use is what they call strewing, which is leaving educationally interesting things lying around. <laughs> so it's non-directive, but just let the kids trip over it, find the resources, go to the interesting places, let them ask the interesting questions, and ask the questions with them. Um, I guess also from the parenting perspective, if I can quote John Holt, because John Holt was the founder of unschooling. Um, he was a teacher, and what he did was keep really good diaries, what's working in the classroom, what's not working in the classroom. And out of that, he developed unschooling, which is going at the child's pace, letting the child build their own educational framework. And he said, all I'm saying can be summed up in two words, trust children. Nothing could be more simple or more difficult. Difficult because to trust children, we must first learn to trust ourselves. And most of us were taught as children that we could not be trusted. And that's the fundamental difference with the unschooling approach, is that we're raising children, hopefully, to trust themselves. And we're investing trust in them. Red, you had an insight the other day about not doing um, single age learning groups? Yes. Okay, now I've got to formulate a sentence. <laughs> You're right. We've got time. I believe that, like, with how I've, like, learned and such, I've been really around adults. I've not so much been around children my age, which, in a way, has led me to basically, in a way, age mentally faster. I basically have, act, I act like an adult because you emulate your environment, monkey see, monkey do. And so by being around adults, I have learnt to act like an adult and act among adults, which means I am not being trained for a world that's temporary, but the world I will grow into. And so there's a, a theoretical connection with that. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Jean Leadloff, the continuum concept. But she looked at the way um, traditionally um, people took their children to work. You know, mum has baby, feeds baby, straps baby on, gets back out into the fields. And children, therefore, are integrated into life and work as in one smooth continuum, rather than being segregated into institutions and taught. And that, is, um, that flows beautifully into what we're trying to achieve when we're unschooling. I learned a lot about parenting through this. I learned a lot about role modeling. It really doesn't matter what you try to teach your children. They're gonna learn the most from who you are, which is, Challenging. <laughs> My children have, are now calling me to task on having good boundaries. If you want to raise good children, be a good person. <laughs> yeah. But I can get so passionate about a cause that my boundaries and my self-care goes right out the window and I've got adult children now calling me to task on that. Um, and seeing that in themselves and saying, um, <clears throat> I know where we got that from. So I think it is important. There were times when, because as Redden said, being freed on the internet was a great source of learning. We've got a list here of, of resources. A lot of them are online. And 
But when Redden was younger, I liked having the, the computer in the family space with no headphones. So that when I'm hearing some gamer go into a misogynistic rant, I can say, listen, I don't like the way he's talking about women. And we could Did have that conversation. You know, capital G on gamer. <laughs> yes. So there are, there are pitfalls and there are things we've had to work around. And I think maybe we should come around to talking about how our experience interacts with the neurodivergence. Um, and the first thing I thought of in that was Redden's experience with agoraphobia. Do you want to talk about it? I need to think of something to say. In a way, this no schooling has led to me staying home a lot more. And that has led to me, in a way, struggling to leave the house. I need to think of more words. Thank you. It's fine. And part of it is that, though I know once I'm out, I'll be fine, the first step of anything is always the hardest. And so I find like all the stress comes before a trip. Like before this, there was just an avalanche of stress. But, after, but now I am in it, it's a lot easier. It's the first step of anything is always by far the hardest. So we were observing this reluctance in red and just before COVID hit. <laughs> And so we were working around ways and, and reasons to leave the house and things to engage with that were interesting. And then COVID. What COVID did was help to build the other ways of having a social life and the other ways of interacting with friends, playing games online, using Discord, all of that. Um, so, you know, that's been a huge positive. Um, one thing I think... One of the things we did, some of you, another alternative education system would be called democratic schools. And it's a very similar process to what we do. I read Jan Fortune Wood's book, With Consent, Parenting for All to Win. And, and the thesis in that book is that you can, as a family, you can brainstorm the solutions and run your family in a way that suits all of the members. So this is really good for getting around some of the issues of, um, equal voices and capacity, because you're supporting the family to find the solutions that work for everyone. And democratic schools do that. They try and get the students having a say in how the school is run. So when Red and siblings were quite small, I remember sitting down in a park in London and saying, right, so let's say there's no rules. What's okay in our family? What's not okay in our family? Um, do we agree that it's not okay to hit people, that it's not okay to say mean things to each other? And what do we do when family members do that? And whose responsibility is it to, to call people out on this? And we came up with a system that we were happy with, that the kids should be able to call us out just as much as we should be able to call them out. And there's that sense of having responsibility that we were trying to build in. Um, yeah. Do you have a comment? Alarm. <laughs> yes, an alarm. <laughs> yeah. I believe that, like families should be equal. Like the parents should like power over the children. Everyone should have an equal voice because children are just adults but smaller. <laughs> they are they are still people with voices and opinions and rights that need to be supported. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what happens <laughs> when you give them a voice. <laughs> it seems like such a small ask. I know with some of my kids have gone out into the world and they've said, listen, this isn't fair. And their peers have said, we know, but it's life. And my kids have said, well, why are we accepting this? And they kind of get the response of like, we really appreciate your <laughs> energy, but you know, it's so foreign to them that you would question everything. <laughs> but it's not foreign to my kids at all. Questioning everything has kind of become a way of life. Um, not questioning things causes so much wrong. If you question the system you're in, the system can change and improve. If you do not question it, it will only get 
worse. <laughs> so with five minutes left, I'm just been notified. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the neurodivergence and, and the various diagnoses. Um, because for us, and this idea of not patho pathologizing um, autism, which, see, I'm, I'm undiagnosed autistic. Actually, none of my kids have the autism diagnosis because not being in, fitting into a system meant that at home we didn't need the label. We know who we are, we know what suits us, we arrange our environment to suit ourselves. Um, it becomes more of an issue when they want to step out into the world. Neurodivergent understands neurodivergent. Yeah, yeah, and the importance, nah, the home ed movement is full of neurodivergent families and children. Mm -hmm. So that nurturing of being around our own people is something that we've been really privileged to have as a big part of our lives. Um, but I did miss the ADHD in my eldest. And my eldest was saying to me, Mum, there's something wrong with me. I, I sit down, I want to do something. I sit down at my computer and I try. And then I just can't. There's a block. And, I, and so, I, well, is it motivation? No, I know what I want to do. I sit down there to do it and I just can't. And so then I start playing a game or doing something else. And now I, my understanding of ADHD was absent and I said to them at the time, I don't know what this is. All I can suggest is that we see the GP and the, um, they were about Redden's age then, so 14, 15, and they didn't want to go through the medical system. And I respected that. Now, as a parent, maybe this is one of my regrets. Maybe I should have pushed it because now they've just finished their final year of a games design degree at Abertay in Scotland. And um, they have had that constant block of not knowing, not having all of the strategies for some of the life skills, like meeting deadlines, like um, you know, personal organisation. There's a word for that, but it's not coming at the moment. Um, yeah, anyway, but so there, there, there was that. Whereas my, then my third child, the one that's studying counselling, um, when they were about 17, I took them to get their dyslexia diagnosed. They're very severely dyslexic. So in spite of reading and writing every single day of their lives, and in fact, when they did the tests, their writing skills were higher than their reading skills because they are a writer, they write, they write poetry. Um, so that was important to them but they really struggled with language. And if I hadn't got that diagnosis, the access to third level and the supports wouldn't have been there. So when we reach out, when we need the medicalizing, which isn't very often, it's usually to access supports and helps. If we had this inclusive Article 24 vision that Rosemary was talking about, we'd probably need less medicalizing. And I mean, that shows you the, the, the importance of the social model and why that's how we need to work in this area. Do you have anything else? We've got like a couple of minutes. So do you have any See. things you think are important? <sighs> the human mind is a complex thing. Like all these like little neurodivergences and disorders and stuff are complicated things. Like, there's no simple way of understanding them because there is no standard. It's always different. Everyone has it different. The same condition can show it in a million different ways and all be completely unique. Hmm. And so that's why social models and stuff are important because to understand the person, you need to understand the person, <laughs> not just look at like some like brain scan and go, hmm, you appear to have this condition. You have to look at the person themselves and see how the condition they have shows up in them. Yeah, and, and that's been the beauty of unschooling, is that we've been able to tailor what we do for each family member as an individual. So when I was writing an application for our right, because we, we moved here when, just when Redden was three months old. So we were already home educating, but not in Ireland. So we did the application to be approved. And when I wrote it, it struck me that I had a different approach for each child. 
And I thought, we must be doing it right. And that's our time up. <laughs> I should well done. quickly use the toilet. I should be back for the Q&A. Do you want to take your mic off? Yes. We'll just unplug it from here. Okay. Um, a huge, huge big thank you to both of you, to Pippa and Reardon, for, for giving us such a, a clear insight to what is undoubtedly a 20 plus year journey, but a fantastic insight. And again, some of the things I'm going to be taking away from as Ombudsman for Children, the concept of trust children. You know, um, I always talk about include, where we do our best to, to include children in various different ways, and whether it's children with disabilities or children homeless, wherever it is, hearing their voice. I always say you get a much better system, a much better product when you ask the children rather than assume stuff. So trust the children is, is being brought to a whole different level there. Um, also, I, I like the, you know, the idea that, and this is the bit that scares every parent, if you want to raise good children, be a good parent. <laughs> Very, very uh, onerous task on all of us. But thank you very much. I look forward to, to the conversation later on as well. OK, we're going to move online now. And we're going to hear from uh, Frederica Satimi, who works as Inclusive Education Program Manager for Inclusion International. In this role, Frederica coordinates the Catalyst for Inclusive Education initiative to help Inclusion International's members to promote inclusive education and supports, and supports the development of effective approaches to address inclusive education issues and challenges. So, Frederica, are you there? Good morning, yeah. everyone. My Good name morning. is Federica Settini, and I work as Inclusive Education Program Manager in the Secretariat of Inclusion International. In my role, I support the work of um, our members in the Americas region on all themes and uh, that are relevant for the, uh, for the network. And with our wider network, I managed a program, a program called uh, uh, Catalyst for Inclusive Education. I wish I could be there with you today. I'm very sorry I couldn't make it. Before we talk about the Catalyst for Inclusive Education uh, program, let me give you a short overview of, the, of what in inclusive, Inclusion International is. Inclusion International is the international network of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Our network is made up of individuals and organizations who share our common goals. Uh, a world, mainly a world where people with intellectual disabilities and their families can equally participate and be valued in all aspects of community life. Our full members are organizations of self-advocates, organizations of families, or a mix of them. Uh, individuals can also apply for, uh, for membership. We have over 200 member federations in over four, uh, 140 countries in all the regions of the world. If you visit our website, inclusion-international.org, you can find an interactive map uh, with the list of our member organizations. <clears throat> We uh, influence inclusive policies at national and, and international levels and have driven the rapid uh, ratification of the CRPD, the United Nations Convention on the, right, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, with other like-minded partners from the cross disability movement. Our projects and programs support um, our members to become effective advocates within their communities. And we have built a global community of self-advocates and families that are working towards a more inclusive world. So let's take a, look, a quick look at, the, uh, at our um, uh, strategy of main, main, the main strategy of Inclusion International. 
which is based on three main objectives. So the first one being support, grow the support for our vision of inclusion. This means that we support self-advocates leader and their self-advocates self -advocates, uh, groups, family leaders with their family leaders groups, partners and allies to build and strengthen a vision of inclusion, which is based on human rights and shared values. Enable, the, the second goal is to enable and strengthen shared advocacy within the network. And this, and this means that we identify and prioritize clear targets uh, uh, for our advocacy goals. The third goal is to expand shared learning opportunities to support the work of our members. So we identify and provide good practices to be shared by members. Then we also support and develop projects at the country level to demonstrate and implement the, these good practices and also create learning opportunities and platforms for members. This results obviously uh, in a growing body of evidence-based knowledge and good practices, increased collaboration between members and allies and strengthened uh, regional networks. Um, the main programs of Inclusion International are uh, the Catalyst for Inclusive Education program uh, and uh, Empower Us. Catalyst is Inclusion International's initiative to support members advance inclusive education in their countries, regions, and at, and at global level. Inclusion International's program uh, um, uh, empower us is uh, um, aimed to support uh, self-advocacy leadership to grow. It is developed following Inclusion International Global Report on Self-Advocacy for Inclusion. So I'm now going to talk uh, to you more about uh, Catalyst. A few years ago, we asked our members why they wanted to be part of our network. And it was clear that they valued the role that Inclusion International had played at the UN level and in global advocacy. Many of our members said that it had been important to have a role in the convention negotiation, in the development of the general comment number four with the CRPD committee. They valued um, the, their membership in, uh, in Inclusion International for having a common and stronger voice and for the opportunities to share resources, knowledge and strategies. They also said that they needed support to be able to advocate more effectively at the national level for the implementation of the CRPD and with a strong focus on inclusive education. Our members are involved in many different aspects of inclusion, but inclusive education is something that almost all our members are involved in. And um, this was one of the main reasons why Inclusion International came together 60 years ago, and it remains one of the issues that uh, really drives our work. Catalyst was built on the following assumptions. Most Inclusion International members have knowledge and capacity to tackle some aspects of the work related to inclusive education, but they needed a safe space to share their knowledge and experiences. Uh, members needed to work together to create global and regional tools and resources that can support the wider movement to replicate and scale up successful inclusive education advocacy models. Members can support each other to do inclusive education advocacy work uh, at national, regional and global level 
by sharing on the upcoming opportunities and on the possible technical gaps. By coordinating our work on inclusive education, we can strengthen our common advocacy voice for stronger impact. We need to tap into external knowledge to bridge uh, specific technical gaps to support our advocacy work. The goals of the, uh, briefly, the goals of the uh, program are to be a space to, for members to, uh, who are experts in inclusive education to connect, um, to support members by giving technical advice about inclusive education, to help with the work of the catalyst for inclusive education as needed, and some examples of the work for Catalyst for Inclusive Education that the group might do are uh, giving direct support to other members uh, through um, the project work, co-creating materials or tools about inclusive education, putting together case studies to share good practices, Supporting Inclusion International's um, Council with their work, with their work to, uh, to operationalize um, the inclusive education position paper approved by the General Assembly in um, November 2023. We will look at more examples uh, later on in this presentation. Our guiding framework for the work around inclusive education is based on uh, our network's inclusive education position paper and our statement of unity, the sustainable development goals, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with, with Disabilities, the CRPD. This is our detailed catalyst strategy. This is not an accessible slide. It is just useful as a written chart for us. Um, so I'm going to try and go through this with you by summarizing it. However, this is a part this is uh, part of the slides that have been uploaded on the summer school platform in case any one of you would like to study it closer. The impact of our work is uh, self-advocates and families meaningfully participate in system change for inclusive quality and equitable education. Goal one says develop and strengthen members' common understanding of inclusive education and help them to impact others. So one of the initial out outputs of this goal uh, has been to work on a draft position paper on inclusive education um, that then was renew reviewed by the Inclusion International Council and went through regional consultations and was finally approved by the General Assembly in November 2022. We do this exercise periodically to ensure that within the network, we are on the same page on the themes that are most important for us. Goal two says develop a set of advocacy tools to support members' um, advocacy work at all levels. These advocacy tools are being developed by our network with the support of the Catalyst, and they have the aim to operationalize our position paper on inclusive education. Besides the written resources, we are launching an e-learning platform for our, for our members where they collaborate uh, to create courses on specific topics related to inclusive education and where they can find the other tools the Catalyst creates, such as country case studies, records, re recordings of key discussions, etc. The learning platform also hosts sections uh, related to other topics besides inclusive education. Goal three says um, enhance the collaboration among Inclusion International members and strengthen the voice of regional networks. 
The Catalyst includes a regional response team that work to create more collaboration on initiatives related to inclusive education in their regions, also using the support of the other uh, regions, other regional response teams, and the expert advisors of the Catalyst. They might organize ad hoc webinars on specific topics so that global knowledge is made relevant to the regional context or others. Goal 4 says support members with technical implementation of inclusive education in their countries. This is where we use the catalyst to accelerate the implementation of inclusive education practices at country level. This can happen on an on-demand basis or through development projects. Goal 5 says collect, create, and share information, knowledge, learning, and resources on inclusive education among members. That links to the creation of knowledge and evaluation or on best practices. First of all, the main, when we look at the structure of the catalyst, uh, the main way to be part uh, of the catalyst is to be, be or become a member of Inclusion International and, and uh, as an organization of persons with disabilities and their families or as an individual. We have a global team or secretariat that is formed by the co-chairs Diane Richler and Monica Cortez, as well as the Inclusive Education Programs or Program Manager. Then we have two groups that have been uh, briefly mentioned before in this presentation, uh, the expert advisors and the regional response teams. The, ex the expert advisors are individually who highly specialized on some aspects on, of uh, inclusive education, such as uh, teacher training or litigation for inclusive education, etc. They give their ability to participate in drafting papers, in providing technical, technical support or mentorship to Inclusion International members through a wide variety of activities. The expert advisors are invited to take on their role um, by the co-chairs. The regional response teams are Inclusion International's members. They support the exchange of informa information within the national members, and they help identify where the catalyst should provide support in the regions. They also provide important information from the grassroots level. Both roles are deployed on a voluntary basis. The Catalyst members have been involved in work related to development projects, scoping missions, advocacy events, and planning, as well as thematic discussions. Examples of projects are uh, Inclusion Matters, a NORAD funded the project active between 2020 and 2022 on inclusive education and self-advocacy. This project provided technical assistance, support in advocacy tools creation and strategy planning and inclusive education courses held with the support of the Catalyst. Empowering families to leverage community resources for inclusive education, which is a, a World Bank's inclusive education initiative funded uh, project um, that started in 2022 and is still uh, ongoing. Um, the products of this, uh, um, of this project are a series of toolkits on inclusive education uh, for uh, organization of organizations of persons with disabilities and created by organizations of persons with disabilities. 
Catalyst also held scoping missions in Paraguay, Peru, Nepal, Ghana, Ethiopia, Rwanda, um, these countries so far. Most of them resulted in policy change and all of them helped the national organization to develop plans of actions to tackle the key issues related to inclusive education that they faced. Catalyst was active in uh, regional and international advocacy events. Um, among the regional ones, because uh, there, are, there are many international ones, um, we find a uh, Sharjah Inclusive Education Conference on Inclusive Education that was held in 2022, and uh, the UAE, uh, which was in UAE, and the Inclusive Education Visioning Workshop in Eastern Europe in 2021. Among the thematic discussions that the Catalyst have held within the group, we had transitioning from special to inclusive education system, coordinating discussions on annual global um, education monitoring reports, using strategic litigation to advocate for inclusive education, etc. cetera. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, should you have any questions, I'm more than happy to respond now. Um, and uh, if you want to contact me, this is my email address, Federica Settini at inclusion-international.org. For more information, you can also visit our website at inclusion-international.org slash program slash catalyst dash for dash inclusive dash education slash. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Frederica. That's, uh, that was another excellent presentation. Really, thank you for that insight or uh, understanding of your work. I suppose, again, what it does for me is it highlights, I noticed one of the challenges that you put up on the slide was that um, inclusive education or inclusive education is a process that needs close and continuous monitoring in order to be protected. And that ties in with the fact that you said inclusive education is why you started the organization 60 years ago. And it shows we haven't made the progress we want, that wholesale progress that Rosemary was talking about as well. 